All right, guys, I wanted to come on with you guys today to talk about some bonus material. And today's topic is going to be neuromuscular disorders. And so as soon as I can get PowerPoint to behave, there we go. All right, so we're going to talk about neuromuscular disorders. And some of the disorders that we're going to focus on are going to be neural tube defects, which is also called spina bifida, Guillain-Barre syndrome, A myotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS, myasthenia gravis, Parkinson's, and multiple sclerosis. Uh, the reason why I've grouped these all together because they affect mobility based on the neurological system. And so um, I've also grouped them based on age. And so as we get started, we're going to talk about neural tube defects first because that happens um, in utero or during embryonic development. So let's get started. Neural tube defects, also known as spina bifida for short, and I just wanted to break it down here for you. Um, it is a central nervous system defect that results from the neural tube, or i.e. what becomes the spinal column, fails to close completely during embryonic development. So this occurs in utero as the fetus is developing and relatively early on, we're talking like the first couple of weeks. So it's extremely important in order to prevent it is to have females who are of childbearing age or, and of course, during pregnancy to take a folic acid supplement. Because what happens is this folic acid actually helps for the nervous system to form in utero. Also helps with red blood cell production, but that's for another, another conversation for another time. Um, and so typically complications that occur from the neural tube defect, and again, you have to remember this is the spine not completely closing. So you start to think about neurological issues and motor function issues as it relates to the lower half of the body. And so we're talking about sensory motor defects, dislocated hips and joints, um, something called club foot, and even hydrocephalus. Typically how we fix spina bifida is a surgical closure that occurs relatively quickly after birth. So we have a um, couple of pictures here so you can kind of see, this is how the normal spine develops right here. We're gonna talk about the different uh, types of spina bifida here in just a minute, but spina bifida occulta, which is probably, um, if you're on a scale of like least to worst, this is probably the least uh, with a minimal amount of effects, but it's spina bifida occulta, and that just means there's an abnormal opening in this bone. These bones didn't completely form at the back side of the spine. And then we have with a meningeal cell, which is a sac, much like this baby picture has down here, just a protrusion sac that contains mostly cerebrospinal fluid. And then there's a myelomeningeal cell, which is also pictured here, but this is where um, spinal nerves actually are involved in the, in the sac. So let's talk about these. So spina bifida occulta, this is on the back side, so posterior vertebral arches do not close, particularly in the lumbosacral area. So very lower back is what we're talking about. The spinal cord remains intact and is typically not visible through this um, particular type of spina bifida. The meninges are not exposed on the skin surface, and very, very rarely are there any neurological deficits. This is probably the easier one. Uh, how do we know this happens? Well, of course, we have plenty of ultrasounds that happen during the pregnancy stage that can help us. But also, they have found that if the baby is born with a patch of hair in that lumbar sacral area, so on the outside, it's, it's a very hairy spot on that baby, where there's no other hair, and I'm talking dark hair um, spot, they have found that that's kind of an indication that there's a spina bifida occulta present, and they would do further testing at that point. The next type we have is a closed neural tube defect, and this is kind of a diverse group of defects. 
the spinal cord definitely has malformations of fat, bone, or even the meninges. It's, it has various degrees here. Uh, there's usually few or no symptoms, and in some situations, the malfunction may cause some bowel and bladder dysfunction. Uh, that's another thing, because we're talking about the lower half of the body, there could be um, potential for bowel and bladder concerns. Next, we have the meningeal cell. This is a protrusion that involves the meninges and a sac-like cyst that contains cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, usually in the midline of the back, and again, lumbar sacral region. Typically, there's not a lot of defects present, but there is a high risk for rupture of that cyst, which we'll talk about in just a minute, rupture of that sac-like, cyst-like sac as well as some infection kinds of issues. And then if you, if you will, again, on that scale of least to worst kind of scenario, the myelomeningeal cell happens to be the most severe. And this is a protrusion of the meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, nerve roots, and even a portion of the spinal cord can be involved. This is a very, very thin membrane sac, and it is prone to leakage and rupture and we definitely have neurological deficits that are involved in the myelomeningeal cell. So let's talk about some assessment findings. Again, this is all gonna depend on the level of spinal cord involvement when we talk about those four different types. So how involved is the spinal cord in this neural tube defect? Um, there could be a visible spinal defect, so you can look and see the defect from the back of the skin. There can be flaccid paralysis of the legs. Again, bowel and bladder dysfunction, either urinary incontinence or what we'll call neurogenic bladders. And there's also the possibility of hip and joint deformities as well as dislocations. And then there's the potential for hydrocephalus or water on the brain in layman's terms. So our priorities for this patient is going to Big, big, big priority is a neurological assessment. We need to know how involved the nervous system is with this defect. We have to monitor this baby for hydrocephalus, signs that there might be increased intracranial pressure. So things that we would do would be measure head circumference, assess whether or not the fontanelles are bulging, particularly the anterior fontanelle. Uh, irritability in the child is common, unable to soothe them, crying, things of that nature, all let you know that there's an increased intracranial pressure. We have to focus on protecting that sac, okay, because again, it is prone to rupture. If we rupture, that is a loss of cerebral spinal fluid that is a source of infection for that baby, so we have to protect that sac for all eternity. Um, or at least until it gets fixed, not all eternity, but until they can take her to surgery and fix it. Um, so we use sterile, moist, non-adherent dressings. We have to keep it moist. Have to, have to, have to. Again, preventing infection, so washing hands, aseptic technique, making sure that that um, area stays clean and dry. Early signs of infection would be an elevated temperature, irritability, uh, the baby's lethargic or listless, uh, nuchal rigidities where they have that stiff board-like um, appearance to their back, uh, maybe even some overarching of their back. We tend to put these patients in prone position for obvious reasons. We can't have the baby lying flat on its back. Um, this would be the exception to back to sleep because that pressure on that sac will cause rupture. So this baby has to be prone. Uh, we would want to prepare not only the child, but also the family for surgery. This is, this is a major surgery. Most people don't have babies and anticipate they get whisked away to surgery relatively quickly. So not only do we have to prepare for surgery, but there are some psychosocial components to this. Uh, we typically want to be prepared to administer antibiotics both preoperatively and postoperatively because again, this patient, this baby is at high risk for an infection. And then we have to start talking to the parents about the eventual long-term care of this child. And so what that includes is positioning, again, most likely gonna be prone for the first little bit, feeding because we want that nutrition so the body can help heal this, the area, range of motion exercises so those hip and upper thigh areas don't get stiff um, because we can have contractures and some, some muscle atrophy there. 
uh, good skin care, just basic wound stuff after surgery. Also, um, bowel and bladder elimination programs. Sometimes, actually most of the time, these children end up with a neurogenic bladder, which means they cannot void or use the restroom like me or you can. And so a lot of times what will happen is we have to teach clean intermittent catheterization at home. And the reason why I say clean is because having to catheterize a baby every two to three hours, it's going to be near impossible to remain sterile and have that many supplies. So a lot of times patients, even older patients that have neurogenic bladders, they will, they will go home learning a clean technique to perform intermittent catheterization. A lot of times these babies are ordered antispasmodics. In, or the, in other words, they worked on the smooth muscle of the bladder to increase bladder capacity and improve continence issues. We also want to help them with a bowel program that includes high fiber diet, increasing fluid suppositories as needed. So those are all home teaching things. Next, we're going to move on to Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS. All right, Guillain-Barre syndrome is an acute infectious neuronitis or inflammation of both cranial and peripheral nerves. So if you think about what the cranial nerves do, that'll be around facial kinds of things, facial features, facial functions, as well as peripheral nerves. So down into the arms and legs. This happens because the immune system basically overacts, overreacts to whatever infectious process that happens and begins to destroy the myelin sheath. And when we think about the myelin sheath, we need to start thinking about nerve impulses. So these nerve impulses become very slow. The syndrome usually happens uh, immediately after like the upper respiratory infection, gastroenteritis. There also has been some linkage to the flu vaccine with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Not completely common, but not completely uncommon either. The recovery for this is a very slow process and can take up to years. Some assessment findings that we would find in GBS would be paresthesias, those pins and needles, kind of tingling sensations, pain and hypersensitivity to touch. And I mean like even the sheets of the bed drives these patients bonkers. Like it, it's extremely painful for them very light items touching their skin. They have weakness of the lower extremities. Again, remember those peripheral nerve paths. And then there's gradual progressive weakness of the upper extremities and even the facial muscles. Those are the um, cranial nerves coming into play at that point. There is a potential for progression to respiratory failure. So hint, hint, the respiratory is gonna be a number one priority in GPS. There is a potential for cardiac dysrhythmias and, of course, abnormal EEG, and that is the um, electroencephalogram findings or brain waves. So what are some priorities for Guillain-Barre syndrome? Again, I gave you a hint towards this already. Number one is respiratory. Remember, your NCLEX loves ABCs, so we always want to assess the respiratory status. We want to provide respiratory treatments and support as needed. These patients may even need mechanical ventilation, so we have to be aware of that as they progress, potentially progress. We have to assess their cardiac status, again, on our ABCs. Pain management, but because remember, they have a high sensitivity or pain with even the lightest of touch, so we have to focus on pain management. Another focus area would be mobility, because again, if it affects the peripheral nerves, we're talking about arm and leg function, which impairs mobility as those areas begin weakening. And then of course, there is support for the family and the patient. This is typically not expected. This is not a genetic disorder that can be passed along from patient to, or patient to child, mother to father, those kinds of things are from the mother and the father. So we have to realize that a sudden change in my neurological status, like I am a wonderful adult, I'm just up and I'm healthy and I'm walking and I'm doing all the things and then bam, 
suddenly I have this progressive weakening of my muscles. So there's a lot of psychosocial things that go in with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And then of course, there is the management of symptoms. And so what I mean by that is as the symptoms occur, we have to do supportive treatment for those things. All right, we're gonna move on to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS for short. This is also called Lou Gehrig's disease. It is a progressive degenerative disease that specifically involves our motor function. The sensory and autonomic nervous systems are not involved and there's rarely, if ever, any mental status changes. So this is all physical. In other words, their brain knows exactly what's going on while their body continues to fail. Uh, the cause of this disease may be related to excess of glutamate, and that glutamate is responsible for relaying messages between our motor neurons. As the disease progresses, muscle weakness and atrophy will develop until there's complete flaccid um, tetraplegia, which is just complete flaccidity all over the body or flaccid. Uh, eventually, respiratory muscles become affected, which leads to respiratory compromise, pneumonia, and even death. And unfortunately, there is no known cure. And again, treatment is basically based on the symptoms. So we're treating the symptoms, not the disease. So priority assessments, I've already given you some hints into this. Again, airway and breathing are huge for these patients. There could be respiratory difficulty, which again could lead to respiratory compromise, pneumonia, or even death. These patients get tired just with speaking. Their whole body just gets fatigued and tired. They have muscle weakness and atrophy because again, if you're not using these muscles, they begin to waste away. These patients eventually have tongue atrophy. So when we start thinking about tongue and upper airway mouth issues, we worry about dysphagia or difficulty talking, difficulty swallowing. Um, these patients have weakness in the hands and in the arms. They have a very nasal quality to their speech. So if you ever heard of this kind of nasal noises that come from the nose, that's how their speech is evolves and then dysarthria. So these patients are very progressive and unfortunately I'd like to say that it's a slow progression but there are some instances depending on how the body's response to this disease process. I've actually seen some ALS patients advance in less than a year um, and, and die within a year of diagnosis. So very very sad disorder. So some of our priorities, again, assess that respiratory status. We have to institute things to prevent aspiration. Remember, if we have that tongue atrophy, which controls our chewing and our swallowing, we have a potential, or these patients have a potential for aspiration. And so we wanna prevent aspiration. And how do we do that? We sit them upright for feeding. We may have to thicken their fluids. They may eventually need a D tube or a PEG tube, some sort of gastrostomy tube in order to feed them. Again, we wanna provide respiratory treatments and support. These patients will typically progress to needing um, a tracheostomy and then ventilator support until they progress to death. Um, we also wanna watch for mobility because again, this is a progressive deterioration of their motor functions. And so their ability to walk and perform daily activities is gonna progressively get worse and worse and worse. Guys, I hate to be doom and gloom, but you literally watch these patients slowly waste away and die. Um, and for that reason, we have to have a lot of support, not only for the patient, but for the family, lots of psychosocial support, lots of involvement with social work, case managers, coordination of care. There are some places like our facility that's local to us or to me, actually has an ALS clinic that um, these patients visit once a month and it's free of charge and they do all of their care coordinations there. Speech therapy sees them, physical therapy sees them, the nurse is involved with their care, case manager, pharmacy, physician, there's a whole lot of working pieces that go into that. We also very early on have to talk to these patients about advanced directives because death will be imminent. And then again, like I said earlier, it is a management of symptoms. So when they have speech issues, we manage those symptoms. When they have 
respiratory concerns, we intervene for the management of those symptoms. All right, we will move on to myasthenia gravis, or MG for short. And myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular disease that is characterized by considerable or profound weakness and abnormal fatigue of our voluntary muscles. Remember, these are the ones that we control. Voluntary is the things that we get to, to move and decide which gets to function. There is a defect, defect in the transmission of nerve impulses, particularly at the myoneural, so the muscle nerve junction. The cause is one of three things. There's either not enough acetylcholine, there's an excess amount of cholinesterase, or the muscle fibers just don't respond to acetylcholine. So those are the three options in myasthenia gravis. The assessment, again, we're looking at weakness and fatigue. A lot of these patients have difficulty chewing, difficulty swallowing, difficulty with speech, also known as dysphagia, ptosis or the eye drooping, diplopia, weak and a hoarse voice. They progress to difficulty breathing diminished breath sounds, and eventually we're talking about respiratory paralysis or failure. Okay, wasn't sure if the dog was going to keep barking. Hang on. I'll be right back. All right, sorry about that. Um, when I think about myasthenia gravis, the word gravis is very close to gravity. And so when I think about the progression of symptoms in myasthenia gravis, I think from the top, down. So it progresses from the top down. So I start with the difficulty chewing and swallowing, difficulty speaking, my eyes are droopy, my voice gets weak, and then it progresses down into my breathing to the point where it's respiratory paralysis and or failure. So really it's from the top down or gravity that takes over. So again, our priorities with with so far with all of these has been our respiratory status. We have to assess the respiratory status. We have to assess the patient's ability to turn, cough, and deep breathe adequately enough. We have to monitor and prepare for impending respiratory failure. We have to maintain emergency equipment at the bedside at all times. This includes uh, suctioning, uh, airway, like an AMBU bag, some sort of device to be able to support their breathing. We have to frequently assess their vital signs. You want to assess their speech and swallowing abilities. Again, they have a high potential for aspiration. So we want to promote that high thalers or completely sitting up when eating. We want to assess their our musculoskeletal system. So we want to see how strong they are. They get tired really, really easily. So we need to work on conserving energy, conserving strength, allowing for rest periods, making sure that we plan very short activities. We want to minimize muscle fatigue. We have to administer anticholinesterase medications. We'll have a whole module on medications around the neurological system. So let's not get too deep into this. This is really just kind of a bonus module. I don't think you really have to worry about anticholinesterase medications at this moment. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but we also need to have certain things that these patients need to avoid. They need to avoid stress, infections, fatigue. There are some over-the-counter medications because those can lead to a myasthenia crisis. And we're going to talk about those in just a minute. Um, this patient should also wear a med alert bracelet or those medical alert bracelets, jewelry, necklaces, something on the body at all times to alert a provider that they have myasthenia gravis because a lot of medications that we might administer in an emergency situation would actually interfere with their anticholinesterase medications. Um, and then we need to assess for whether or not they're in a myasthenia crisis or a cholinergic crisis. And this is how we do those. So on the left side of the screen, I have what's very classic of myasthenic crisis. And on the right side, what's very classic of cholinergic crisis. So in a myasthenic, myasthenic crisis, we're talking about an acute exacerbation of myasthenia gravis. It's a very rapid and unrecognized progression of the disease. 
usually because of inadequate amounts of medication or the body's fighting an infection or their stress or fatigue, all those things that we want them to avoid. What we find in these patients is there's an increase in their vital signs, so pulse, respirations, and blood pressure all go up. These patients become dysmic or having difficulty breathing. They even have anoxia or cyanosis. There is sudden bowel and bladder incontinence and decreased in urinary output. And there's an absence of cough and swallow reflex. So really an advancement of their muscle fatigue and wasting and weakness. Um, and so in these particular patients, we would need an increase in their anticholinesterase medications. Now, on the opposite side of the screen, we have cholinergic crisis. And this is what happens when there's a depolarization of the motor end plates. This happens when we have over medicated with anticholinesterase medications. And we'll talk about a test here in just a minute that's very classic for myasthenia gravis. But in cholinergic crisis, these patients have abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, blurred vision, pallor, uh, the facial muscles begin to twitch hypotension, um, and in this case, we would have the patient hold their anticholinesterase medications and prepare to administer the antidote, which happens to be atropine. <clears throat> so there's a test called the uh, Tensilon test. Now, Tensilon test is performed by a neurologist in order to either diagnose myasthenia gravis for the very first time, or to help determine if the patient's in a myasthenic crisis versus a cholinergic crisis. Now, the important thing to know about this test, extremely important thing to know about this, is that our patients are put at a very high risk for ventricular fibrillation, so we must have emergency equipment, i.e. a crash cart, ready to go at their bedside as soon as we do this test. The other thing that we have to have available is atropine sulfate. This is one that your NCLEX loves to ask you about, okay? So while it may only be one or two questions, again, like I said in the nutrition module, you get these simple things right, then some of your more advanced questions, you kind of have some breathing room on. But atropine sulfate is the antidote for this uh, Tensilon test, and so you have to have it at the bedside. But it also becomes important if we determine it's a cholinergic crisis. <clears throat> so in order to diagnose for myasthenia gravis, if it is positive for myasthenia gravis, the patient will show improvement in their muscle strength after this medication is given. So if they improve with this tensilon, then it's myasthenia gravis. It would not be myasthenia gravis if the muscle strength fails to improve or might even worsen after this is administered. So again, if it is myasthenia gravis, their muscle strength will improve. If it is not myasthenia gravis, then the muscle strength will not improve or will actually worsen. Now, again, worked for myasthenic crisis versus cholinergic crisis in that the myasthenic crisis if I give this test, the muscle strength improves, so I know it's a myasthenic crisis. If it worsens, it indicates to me that that patient is being over-medicated with anticholinesterase medications, therefore we should administer atropine because it is the antidote. All right, so let's move on to Parkinson's disease. We're almost there, guys. We've got two more diseases to talk about. So Parkinson's is a degenerative disease that is caused by the depletion of dopamine. It interferes with those um, excitatory impulses. So our body actually inhibits some of those excitatory impulses, but the Parkinson's actually interferes with that. So those excitatory impulses kind of get out of hand. There is a dysfunction in the extrapyramidal system. It is a very slow, progressive disease that results in very crippling disabilities. Most of the time it involves falls, so safety is a big thing, self-care deficit, uh, complete failure of our body systems, and then there's a mental aspect of depression. There is a mental deterioration that happens in Parkinson's. Unlike ALS, you know, ALS, there is no mental deficit at all. Parkinson's, there is eventually a mental deterioration. 
So some of our assessment findings, we see very abnormal slow movements or sluggish movements, um, delayed physical responses, delayed mental responses, also known as bradykinesia. We may even have akinesia in these patients, which means you're not going to get a response at all. These patients tend to have a very monotonous speech, so it's like mah, 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 when they talk. Progressively, their handwriting gets smaller. They begin to have tremors in their hands and fingers, particularly at rest. It says R rest, <laughs> it's supposed to be at rest. This is also known as pill rolling. Um, they take their forefinger and their thumb and they just rub it back and forth. Um, your textbook probably refers to that as pill rolling. Their tremors become more and more noticeable as they become tired. They have rigid or jerky movements. These patients are typically restless and pace a lot. They have very blank facial expressions. Some even progress to drooling, difficulty with speech and with swallowing. There becomes a loss of coordination and balance, so lots of falling, lots of safety issues, hint, hint a shuffling gait and a hunched over position. And again, that hunched over actually puts them at a fall risk because if you've noticed, the head and shoulders are primarily the heaviest part of the body. And so when they are hunched forward, those patients tend to lose balance and fall forward. So priorities for the Parkinson's disease would be assessing the neurological status, assessing their ability to chew and swallow, we want to encourage a high calorie, high protein, high fiber diet, so we keep all of those functions moving well. Usually small frequent meals. We want to increase their fluid intake to approximately two liters of fluid per day. We want to implement safety measures. Okay, so we don't want them to fall. So we want to give them uh, assistive devices. We want to give them low heeled shoes because, again, high heeled shoes are going to promote falling. So, assistive devices, low heeled shoes. Encourage the patient to pick their feet up with that shuffling gait. Again, they have a propensity to trip and fall. We also want to provide them a firm mattress. We want to teach them proper positioning. We want to promote independence as much as possible, but we also want to provide physical therapy as well as rehabbing. We typically want to um, administer anti-Parkinsonian medications, which actually help increase dopamine in the system. There are some medications that we actually want to avoid, which would happen to be MAOIs, which are monoamine oxidase inhibitors as well as foods that are high in vitamin B6 because those actually block dopamine medications. All right, last but not least, we're gonna talk about multiple sclerosis. All right, so multiple sclerosis is a chronic, progressive, non-contagious degenerative disease of the central nervous system that happens because there's demyelinization of our neurons. Now, unfortunately, this occurs between the ages of 20 and 40 years of age, and there are periods of remission and exacerbation. So there's basically a cycle of flare-ups and remissions, flare-ups and remissions. The causes are completely, are not completely known, mostly unknown, but it's thought to be a result of an autoimmune response or potentially a response to viral infections. What we do know from research is that things that might bring about MS would be high stress situations like pregnancy, extreme fatigue, infection, or even trauma. Um, most of the time, EEG findings, again, the electroencephalogram are abnormal. There are some diagnostic things that can be done for the diagnosis of MS, such as a lumbar puncture. They're looking for gamma globulin levels, and there's also serum globulin levels, but they are higher in the lumbar puncture where the serum levels may be lower. 
So what does this look like? This is again fatigue and weakness. I think you'll notice a pattern here with all of these neurological disorders. There is a progression of weakness and fatigue, um, ataxia and vertigo, tremors, spasticity, particularly of the lower extremities. Again, those paresthesias, which are those pins and needle tingling kinds of feelings, blurred vision, diplopia, and maybe even some blindness here or there, nystagmus, dysphagia. There's a decreased perception to pain, decreased perception to touch, and a decrease in the ability to determine temperature. So we have issues with being able to determine if something is hot or cold. Uh, they typically will have some bowel and bladder dysfunction, including urgency, frequency, retention, and incontinence. They will have some abnormal reflexes, including hyperreflexia, or maybe even absent reflexes. Some of these patients have positive Babinski reflexes. There are some emotional changes such as apathy or euphoria, irritability or depression. And then there's also issues with memory and confusion. So our priorities for these patients are going to be energy conservation, especially during exacerbation. We have to protect these patients from injury. We can help them with diplopia by providing an eye patch. We want to monitor for potential complications such as urinary tract infections, um, kidney stones, pressure ulcers, respiratory tract infections, and contractures. We want to promote regular elimination of the bowel and the bladder. We want to encourage independence in these patients. We want to establish a routine exercise program, but not so stressful to them, okay? Just very plain, basic exercises, nothing too crazy. A lot of times they need assistive devices, maybe even physical and speech therapy. We want to monitor their fluid intake and a balanced diet. And the other thing I want to put here too is these patients are either put on immunosuppressive therapy or they're put on steroid therapies. And so when we go back to looking at the potential infections, um, lack of energy, fatigue, any of that, it all comes from steroids. So when we do things like methylprednisolone, prednisone, and typically during an exacerbation, we do high doses of methylprednisolone. I'm not talking like 25 milligrams. I'm talking like thousands of milligrams in order to get what they anticipate to be an autoimmune problem under control. And so you'll see these high steroid therapies, which what do steroids do? They put us at high risk for osteoporosis, which we've already learned about, as well as puts us at risk for infection. So these patients, some of these external complications occur because of our therapies that we put them on. All right, guys, and that is it. Hopefully you've enjoyed the bonus module just to give you um, a little feel for some things to come. But these are all about neuromuscular disorders in our patients. All right, I hope you enjoyed it and take care. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.